So hi everyone and welcome to this video on a very deep dive on the concept of an indifference curve. So if you recall in the last video of this module, we discussed uh, the utility function and we showed how the utility function uh, can be able to represent the axioms of preferences we, which we had discussed in the very first video of the module. So now we're gonna uh, go into the graphical representation of utility, which is more commonly known to as an indifference curve. While we can visualize the utility function, of course, in a 3D space, uh, we generally tend to be more accustomed to viewing things in a 2D space, just with a Y and an X axis. And that's precisely uh, the dimension of a, a typical indifference curve. So indifference curves are graphical representations of a consumer's preferences. So uh, essentially, uh, we said in the last video that a utility function is a mathematical representation of a consumer's preference. So when we plug in certain quantities, it will dole out a particular value depending on the preference. Now, the indifference curve is essentially functions similarly. Uh, of course, it's derived from a utility function in that we hold a particular level of utility constant while trying to draw uh, combinations of different goods that would yield that same utility. So suppose that we have a utility function which represents a consumer's preference. So uh, with this utility function, a particular level of utility can be derived from many possible combinations of x1 and x2. So in essence, the locus or the combination of points that give the same utility level to the consumer and for which the consumer is indifferent to is known as an indifference curve. So it's a locus like a collection. So it's a collection of points. It's a collection of combinations that give the same utility level, right? So if you try and visualize a utility function, it looks something like this. So it's in 3D space. You have here for our, uh, say we had this utility function, um, u is equal to u x1, x2, right? We have for x2, a space for x2, we have our space for x1, and we have sort of like our z-axis, which is the u, the value of the function itself. Now that's in 3D space. So what we do to derive the indifference curve is we fix the u at some point and we sort of slice this function uh, horizontally and we can get uh, the indifference curves, which look something like this. So this is how an indifference curve tends to look like. So if you notice the numbers here represents your level of utility. So uh, typically something you can already tell is the further you go, the further northeast, right? The further, the further northeast, the higher the utility, right? the higher uh, the utility. So the further you go out northeast, the higher the utility level that is implied, right? So you have here uh, 2.1, then you move further northeast, you get 3.1, 4.1, 5, 6.1, 7.1, .1, and 8.1 respectively, and so on. Of course, there are indifference curves lying, say, here. There's an indifference curve somewhere there, somewhere there, and you have a lot of these combinations that are there. So that's how indifference curves look like. So from that particular graph, we can see that uh, two main characteristics. For one, indifference curves are generally downward sloping. And another one is that indifference curves are strictly convex okay, from the origin. So they're strictly convex and they're also downward sloping. So let's get into these properties. Let's go first with the downward sloping indifference curve. So what we have is if you recall, the indifference curve is a downward sloping curve, right? It looks something like this. So of course it slopes downward. Say this is X2, this is X1, it's downward sloping. And it is an implication of the assumption of non-satiation. So the slope at any point of the indifference curve. So for example, say this is point A, the slope at point A, uh, whoops, looks something like this. So it's that line. At B, it looks something, it's a flatter line somewhere here, right? That's the slope of an IC, and that's an implication of non-satiation. So the slope at any point along the IC, along the IC for any utility, 
is uh, represented by this derivative. That's dx2 over dx1. Recall that your indifference curve, uh, when you graph it, this is x2, this is x1. And you have that indifference curve there. It's essentially the change in x2 given a change in x1. Right? So how will x2 change when your x1 changes? Holding utility constant at this same utility level, u1. Right. So if the IC is downward sloping, then obviously this derivative is going to be negative at any point along the IC. So whether you're starting here or here or here or anywhere, okay, the, the slope will always be some negative quantity. Okay? So that's the implication of a downward sloping IC. So how do we sort of go deeper into this? So for a movement along an IC, Okay, both x1 and x2 change. What do I mean by this? You have an IC here. Right? This is x2. This is x1. Right? Say you had a point A. Okay, point A is this x2a. Point A is this x1a. For me to get here, say B, I would need to change both the amount of x2. This is now x2b. And this one is x1b. So both x1 and x2 change uh, while utility is held constant, right? So that's the case when we're along, when we move along the same in, in difference curve. Now, we can measure this mathematically by taking the total differential of the utility function. So if you recall, your utility function is this form here. If we take the total differential of that, that's du or the change in the utility is equal to the partial of the utility function with respect to x1 times the change in x, x1 dx1 plus the partial of the utility function with respect to x2 times the change in x2 or how much x2 changed. Now, these derivatives should be familiar from our last video. In fact, these are your marginal utility. So this is u1 dx1 plus u2 dx2. And we get the form that we derived here. So if you recall, right, um, du okay, is the change in u. But when you are moving, okay, uh, remember, when we are moving along the same indifference curve, say we move from point A to point B, both of these points still lie along the same indifference curve. So the utility does not change. You may change the quantities of consumption, but when you move from A to B or anywhere in the, on the, along the same indifference curve, the utility does not change. So we equate this one equal to zero. So du is equal to zero, u1 uh, dx1 plus u2 dx2. Oops, u2 okay, dx2. And if you recall, remember, the slope uh, is derived as dx2 over dx1, right? So what we want to do is we want to sort of isolate things out. So we go um, negative u1 dx1, u2 dx2. Then we divide both sides by dx1 dx1. So we get um, negative u1 is equal to u2 dx2 over dx1. We divide both sides by u2 now. And we, uh, and we get uh, u2. And then we get now the form for the slope dx2 over dx1, which is uh, negative u1 over u2, right? And this is your slope of a typical indifference curve. So this is the slope of an IC, right? And it's negative because, again, it's a downward sloping IC. So... Uh, this is that derivation that I just did there. Now, since, remember, by non-satiation, our assumption before, non-satiation implies that u1 is greater than 0 and u2 is greater than 0 because, remember, you prefer more to less, right? So if you recall our slope from the last slide, dx2 over dx1, holding u constant, this is negative u1 over u2, right? You know that this is greater than zero by non satiation. This is also greater than zero. Therefore, it must be that this entire quantity, negative u1 over u2, is less than zero because uh, a positive times a negative divided uh, by a positive is a negative, right? And that clearly shows that the slope is indeed uh, negative. 
Now, what we can do is, like, for some sort of uh, mathematical uh, proof, okay, we can multiply this by negative one, right? And that will take out the negative sign, and we get u1 over u2. And this is a key concept in economics, which we call the marginal rate of substitution, right? So the marginal rate of substitution in math terms is just the negative of the slope of the indifference curve, right? It's the negative of the slope. And you call that the MRS between two goods. So if I take the negative sign as I did there, you get this formula, which is U1 over U2, as I derived earlier. Now, that's it with the downward sloping IC. Let's now get into the strict convexity of an indifference curve. Now, the strictly convex shape of an IC is an implication of the strict convexity assumption that we have had with preferences. And just as a recall, we say that the, according to the strict convexity assumption, we prefer averages. Averages are preferred, okay, are preferred to extremes, right? We prefer averages to extremes. So when the IC is strictly convex, it must be that this second order derivative, which is uh, this one, holding the same utility constant or you're moving along the same indifference curve must be positive. And this means that the slope of the IC increases or becomes uh, less negative as one moves down the IC, right? Now, since both X1 and X2 change as one moves down the IC, then the change in the slope uh, of the slope of the IC, so how the slope that we derived before changes with respect to uh, uh, each good, or uh, yeah, with respect to each good along the same IC, can be obtained by just taking the total differential of it again, right? So, and you can obtain this form that we have here below. So note that uh, given that du1 is equal to this one, Right? So the total differential, so if you recall, U1 is the marginal utility of a good one. If you take the total differential of that, you get the U1, the change in the marginal utility, is equal to your direct partial uh, dx1 plus your cross partial dx2 times dx2 or the change in x2. And the same goes for the other good, your U2. The total differential is the change in your marginal utility for good two can be attributed to u uh, two one times the change in x one plus u two two times the change in x two. And when you plug in the solution to that derivative which we derived earlier, you can get this particular form. You just plug those two things in there. Then when you simplify, you get this particular formula. Note that we actually encountered this part of the formula when we proved that the utility function was strictly quasi-concave. And uh, we can see some similarity between that particular proof and the strict convexity assumption. So before, we said that um, uh, a strictly quasi-concave uh, utility function was an implication that preferences were strictly convex. And I think you can see how it follows through in this concept of an indifference curve. The difference is we just add this one over u2 cube uh, term there when we simplify, and this should be greater than zero. So see the lecture notes for the more detailed solution. So by, again, the assumption of non-sachation, uh, these things here should be positive. So if you recall, right, this term here is greater than zero. Of course, u2 by non-sachation, the marginal utility is positive. So this is some positive quantity. So one divided by a positive times a positive should be a positive, right? So that's, uh, that's the main sign reasoning behind a strictly convex indifference curve. So very similar to how we proved our things before. So now, right, since, uh, this particular derivative is greater than zero, proving the strict convexity, then the slope of the IC increases as one moves down the IC. So the slope of the indifference curve increases as one moves down the indifference curve. But since the MRS is equal to this, we can actually derive something, uh, which is quite interesting. Okay, And notice that if we take the derivative of the marginal rate of substitution with respect to x1, we get a negative term of what we derived here, 
And this is an implication of the diminishing, a diminishing marginal, marginal rate of substitution, right? So this is that implication. So how does that work? Okay, so uh, say you're at point A, okay, at point A, at point A, you have you consume uh, this is x two, this is x one. You consume x two a, and you consume uh, x two uh, b. I'm sorry, x one b. I'm sorry, x one a rather. Now, when you move okay from a to say b, okay, what happens is you're at point A. You have a lot of good two, but only little of good one. So in essence, you're willing to give up quite a bit of good two just to get a little bit more of good one. And that happens here. So when you have here x2b, and then you have here x1b. So for quite a substantial reduction in x2, you get a little bit more of x1. And that just makes you equally happy, right? Because in here, you kind of, at point A, you kind of overconsume A, but at point B, it's relatively more balanced. But this is where the diminishing thing comes in. Okay, say I go to point C now, right? Point C. Okay, you're willing to give up less and less of X2 because it now becomes more scarce to you. So your X2 before was really high at A, but you gave it up a considerable amount at B. Then when you want to move to point C, you're less willing to give that X2 up. So that's a smaller decrease. So that's where the diminishing thing comes in and your x1 will subsequently increase because you trade it off. So that's generally the phenomenon of diminishing marginal rate of substitution. It becomes harder and harder to give uh, to trade off a particular good as you uh, continue to trade it off for more and more units of other goods. Okay? So that's your diminishing marginal rate of substitution, right? So intuitively speaking, as the consumer moves down an IC, he acquires more of good one and less of good two. That was what we drew earlier. And the rate he is willing to give up for good two, uh, for an extra good one, starts to decline. And this is because when a consumer prefers exactly what the preference uh, axiom states, when a consumer prefers an average consumption bundles to extreme consumption bundles, the increasing relative scarcity of good two increases its relative value to the consumer and the increasing relative abundance of good one because you start to trade off good two for good one decreases its relative value. Therefore, to remain indifferent, i.e. along the same indifference curve, the individual's willingness to trade x1 for x2 decreases and that's known as the law of the diminishing marginal rate of substitution. Quite an intuitive concept, quite easy to get. So another thing here is that indifference curves generally follow the transitivity assumption. And uh, by the transitivity assumption, it rules out, okay, it rules out uh, intersecting ICs. Okay, so let's sort of examine our case here. So we have here three points, point A, point B and point C. So why does this val uh, violate it? So at point A, we have um, XA and we have here YA, right? Now at point C, okay, I think this is the same. So say this is also uh, YC uh, and then we have here, okay, uh, XC, okay? Then at B, we have here uh, XB, and then we have here YB. Okay, now let's look closely. Okay, if you look at it, the point A, okay, lies on both IC1 and IC2. Now, okay, by our rule of uh, the Northeast rule that we, the rule of thumb that we discussed before, indifference curves further Northeast generally go, give off a higher utility. And we can see this clearly. So if you look at B versus C, okay, C has, uh, if you compare uh, in their uh, X, and, X and Y, so X, B, X, C, uh, Y, B, Y, C. Okay, so if you compare X, B, and X, C, X, C is greater than X, B. Right? So, and you prefer more to less, so that's better off for you. 
when you have YB and YC, okay, y, YC is greater than YB. So it should follow, of course, that uh, C, point C should give off. Uh, so the utility at point C is higher than the utility at point B. And we can see that graphically because IC2 is at a higher point than IC1. The thing is, point A lies on both of these ICs. And this is where it, uh, it cannot be. Point A okay, is here, has, according to this curve here that I'm going to uh, shade in orange, this curve here, okay, should give the same utility as point C. But this should not be the case because both A and C have the same amount of Y, right? So they have the same amount of one good, but point C has more of another good than point A, right? And they have the same of the other good. So it should be that point C should be at the higher indifference curve than point A, and yet they are at the same indifference curve. And this is a violation of that transitivity assumption. And this essentially rules out these intersecting indifference curves. So indifference curves cannot intersect because it's a violation of that particular assumption. So I hope you got it with that explanation. So just to reiterate, by the transitivity assumption, intersecting indifference curves are not permitted. And it's a violation of local non-satiation and transitivity. Okay? So Mathematically, uh, another thing that we need to point out is convexity, strict convexity to be more specific. Mathematically, a set of points is convex if any two points can be joined by a straight line that is contained completely within a set. Okay, so the assumption of a strictly convex preference and therefore diminishing MRS is equivalent to the assumption that all combinations X1 and X2, which are preferred to X1 star and X2 star, form a convex set. Such combinations lie along a chord connecting any two points along the IC on which the bundle lies. What does this mean? Say I have this indifference curve here, X2. Okay. Then I have here X1. This is an indifference curve. Say I had this combination, say I had A, say I had B. So this is X2A. This is uh, X1A. This is X1B. This is X to B. What this convexity thing is saying here is I can draw a chord between these two points, A and B, okay? And any point along the chord, okay? Say I have a point here, say C, X uh, to C star and um, X one C star, any point along the chord, okay? will be associated with a higher utility than either A or C because it represents a more average bundle than these two bundles, which are generally extreme bundles. And it stems from our assumption that we prefer averages to extremes. So these curves, of course, would lie, points lie along at the higher indifference curve than the original indifference curve, since giving you a much higher utility. So that's it for this uh, video on a deep dive on indifference curves. In the next video, we're going to show some special types of indifference curves and go further in our discussion on the theory of consumer behavior. So thank you very much for standing by in this video. I know it was quite lengthy and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.